What is going on everyone, my name is Andy, welcome back to another FPL video and this one is some of my final thoughts ahead of the game week 5 deadline so we're going to go through some of the key press conference information, answer some of your questions and I'm going to talk about my own team as well. So if you enjoyed the video make sure to give it a like, hit that subscribe button and don't forget to check out Sleeper which is a completely free fantasy football app by using the link in the description below, more on that to come later. All right, let's start with Brighton because a lot of people are waiting for a João Pedro update. So this is what Herzl has said. He will train today with the team. We have to see how it's going. If he can train fully, if he can do all the movements, we won't take any risks. Now, I think it's a positive sign that he's in training. It's not a case that he hasn't been training all week. We know that he was training on Wednesday. So that's Wednesday, Thursday, and then hopefully today on Friday that he would have had quite a few training sessions. So there is a chance that he'll be available to play in game week five against Forrest at home. But the we won't take any risks at the end does worry me a little bit. If I had to guess, I think he'll be on the bench. That would be my assumption right now. That's not a guarantee. I don't have any inside info. I'm literally going off this quote from Herzler. But I think because he missed out completely last week and he wasn't in the Carabao Cup squad either, which is not a massive thing because it was a pretty strong bench. They didn't need him to play in that game. But with all of that combined, now what he's saying on Friday, it doesn't make me massively confident that he's going to play. It doesn't mean you have to sell him, especially if you've got someone on your bench that you can play instead, because I still think he's quite a good long-term option. But game weeks four and five were really where the good fixtures were at. He also went on to say, every team in the Premier League has this key player, this player who makes the difference. In our way, it's João Pedro. But like I said before, we have other great players who can make the difference. So that does sound like a positive sign moving forward. For, you know, the next 10, 15 weeks, as long as he can get fit, that Herzl or Cesar João Pedro is one of his main players. And I did say I think he's more nailed on than people are giving him credit for. But he has to be fit to be able to play. So all I can say is I think he'll be benched. That is not a guarantee. He may well start. What you do with him really depends on how well the rest of your team is set up. If you need a cheap striker, I'd be going Jamie Vardy potentially as a one-week punt. Otherwise, someone like Calvert-Lewin looks pretty good. Or maybe even Chris Wood from game week six onwards. So as expected, we didn't get confirmation as to whether Alexander Izak will be available this weekend. This is what Eddie Howe said about the substitution in game week four. The ball grazed his eye. We thought that was the main reason for him coming off the pitch. Then we found out he had a knock on his foot. We will find out more today and make a decision on him. So he's not completely ruled out, but he's also not been confirmed as available either. And we're very unlikely to get any more information ahead of the deadline. If I had to guess, a bit like I did with João Pedro, I think Izat will start. It sounds like he has got a bit of an issue, but it's not necessarily something major and hopefully something that will just have to be managed. Also keep in mind that Callum Wilson is not available either. So if Izat misses out, it will have to be something like Gordon through the middle, which Newcastle have done before, so it's not a major problem. But if they can get Izak playing, you think that they would do that. So I think there's a decent enough chance that he'll start. But again, you're going to have to look at your own team and see how many other issues you've got. So I'm going to talk about my team later, but just really quickly now, I've got Izak yellow flag, João Pedro yellow flags. I can't be confident that either are going to start, even though I think Izak probably will. So I'm probably just going to sell one and just bench the other. Like That will be my plan, and I'll talk about it a little bit more later. If you've got like Izak, João Pedro, and Muniz up front, you've probably got to make a move somewhere just to make sure that you've got at least one forward playing. If you're selling Izak, if you've got the money to go to Watkins, I don't mind that. I still think because of the fact that Watkins is mostly being substituted early, as a long-term option that costs nearly $9 million, that would put me off a little bit. Now, he did play 83 minutes against Everton, which is a positive sign, but he was subbed early in the Champions League again, although Villa were pretty comfortable in that match. And the fixtures coming up are good. So I think he's a good option as long as he doesn't keep getting subbed off like 60, 70 minutes. Because for 9 million, you don't really want that. If you don't want to go all the way down to like a Vardy or a Calvert-Lewin or a Chris Wood, your other option is probably Solanke at Spurs. 7.5 million hasn't dropped in price. No, I don't understand why either. I don't really get the price changes and stuff like that. Um, but Brentford at home this week, United away in six, Brighton away in seven. And then from eight onwards, Spurs fixtures outside of Man City away in game week 12 are just decent for a long time. So I really like Solanke. We don't know if he's on penalties. It could be Son. 
But I think in that Spurs side, he will get chances. Spurs haven't massively impressed in attack in the last couple of games, but I wouldn't let that put me off too much. So, Isaac, not ruled out, not confirmed as available. I think he'll start, but of course, I can't guarantee it. So if you haven't already checked out Sleeper, make sure you do ahead of game week five. It's a completely free fantasy football app, which you can download by clicking the link in the description below or scanning that QR code on screen. As well as new stats, live scores, and the ability to chat with your friends inside the app, it also has free fantasy football games such as Pick'em, which all you have to do is select who's going to win each match in the Premier League every single weekend. And I'm running a completely free Let's Talk FPL league with prizes on offer every single week. So for game weeks four, five, six, and seven, whoever gets the most predictions correct will win a Premier League shirt of their choice. And if it's tied, I will do a draw on the deadline stream. And then for game weeks four to seven combined, whoever gets the most predictions over that period will win Apple AirPods as well. It's completely free. All you have to do is click that link in the description below or scan the QR code on screen. And I'm just going to submit my picks now. So West Ham versus Chelsea. I'm going to go for West Ham. Villa to beat Wolves. Uh, Leicester to beat Everton, although I'm not completely sure about that. Liverpool to beat Bournemouth. Uh, Fulham, Newcastle, I'm going to go for a draw just in case Isaac uh, misses out. Southampton to beat Ipswich at home. United to beat Palace. I always have to bat Man United, even though that's probably not the way to do it. Spurs to beat Brentford. A draw between Brighton and Forest. And then a draw between City and Arsenal as well. It's as simple as that, and like I said, completely free. Get it downloaded and give it a go. So the Liverpool press conference gave us some news that we weren't expecting, and that was on a slot saying that Alisson is a doubt for Bournemouth at home in game week five. He said he had a slight issue with one of his muscles. We wonder if this game is coming too early or not. It happened before the Milan game, but afterwards he felt it more. So he is a doubt going into the Bournemouth game, but it doesn't look like it's a major long-term issue or anything like that. Slightly... Not great news for anyone that owns Liverpool defenders like Van Dyke, Robertson and Trent, but not, nothing that should sway your opinions too much this week. If you've got them, you're definitely playing them. There's probably not many Allison owners out there. If you've got him and another playing goalkeeper, then I would just start Allison because it's likely that he either is in the 11 or just out of the squad completely. And so if he doesn't play, your other goalkeeper will come on. If you're in a situation where you've got Allison and no backup keeper, I think I would risk it because he hasn't been completely ruled out. And you don't really want to be spending too many transfers on goalkeepers. So either way, I don't think I would sell him unless you're about to wildcard or something like that and you've got a spare transfer and nothing else to do. Then maybe you could just make sure. But I've got a feeling he'll probably play. But as always, like it's hard to, to know for sure because we don't have all the inside information that managers do and they're not going to give us that. He also spoke about Darwin Nunez. He said he'll get his chance in the near future. We play a lot of games. He's fitter and fitter now, but he's in competition with Diogo Jota, who in our and my opinion has done really well in the last games. So Slot is pretty happy with how Jota is playing. And if you're a Jota owner, that's probably quite nice to hear. I think in general, we should expect Gakpo to play on the left and Darwin, <coughs> sorry, Darwin Nunez to play centrally at some point. Like It's going to happen. It doesn't mean it's going to have to happen in Premier League games, or that it will happen regularly. It might be that Darwin Nunez plays like one of the next five or six in the league. You just don't know. If you've got Jota, I wouldn't be particularly worried. I would just play him this week. It's a really good fixture. Perhaps if you're on wildcard in game week six, you can go a bit safer and get someone that's absolutely nailed. But I think Jota has played well. Slot said that himself. So it wouldn't be a massive concern. And we knew that at some point, Darwin Nunez would probably come into the side. Not necessarily to play every single game, but to take minutes off of Jota. So there wasn't a massive amount of team news from Pep Guardiola in Man City's press conference, but obviously De Bruyne did go off with an injury during the midweek game in the Champions League, and he said he feels a little bit better today. Tomorrow we, we train and we will see he could be involved. So De Bruyne is potentially going to be in the squad for Man City against Arsenal. Will he start? I guess it depends how he reacts to training and stuff like that. But I think if they can get him in the team, they will. And if he does start, I think that would make things better for Erling Haaland. It's still going to be really difficult to score many goals against that Arsenal defence. But having De Bruyne in there to unlock it would definitely help. So that's probably promising for anyone that's thinking about captaining Haaland this week. Interestingly, though, uh, he also said he expects something similar to last season's 0-0 draw between City and Arsenal at the Etihad. And I wouldn't be completely surprised if that's the case as well, there's a question in a minute about playing City and Arsenal players. 
I really think it's going to be a low scoring game. I don't expect it to be open. And if it was a nil nil draw, that wouldn't completely surprise me, which is part of the reason I really want to try and get Salah in this week if I can. Not that I think Haaland's a bad captain because he will get a chance or two, maybe three, if he's really lucky and Saliba and Gabriel are off it. And he's on penalties, of course. He'll play the whole game. But it's just, if possible, I just don't like captain and players against City and Arsenal. And you could probably throw Liverpool into that as well. But De Bruyne, if he's potentially back, that could be a good thing for City. So there were a few things that Ange Postacoglu said in the press conference about team news. But the key thing that I want to talk about is what he said about Richardson. He said he's a fair way off. You're better off not asking about him until I give an update because he's not with the first team. And Richarlison is one of the main players in that squad that's likely to play number nine. Obviously, Song can play there as well. Brennan Johnson too. Even Kulisewski played that role in preseason. But Richarlison nowhere near starting. We don't know how long he's going to be out for, but it doesn't sound great. Someone like Solanke has really good minutes going forward. And if anyone's considering him, the fixtures coming up are decent. Brentford at home, Man United away, Brighton away, West Ham at home. And then after that, the fixture run for Spurs is pretty nice. And the minutes we've seen from Solanke so far, when he's been fit, have been quite good. If I just bring him up here. Uh, in the first game, in game week one against Leicester, it was 90 minutes. And obviously then he got injured. So we haven't seen a huge amount from him. But he also played 90 against Arsenal. I know some people were concerned that he played midweek in the Carabao Cup. But I think that's just to build up his fitness and to play more games under Ange so he knows how he wants him to perform that role. So for anyone looking for a striker, if they're looking to sell Isaac or someone like that, I think I think Solanke's a good option around that 7 million mark and is a pretty good price. So yeah, I just wanted to touch on that. Richarlison being out means there's even less competition for that number nine spot. And it looks like Solanke's going to play 90 minutes most weeks like he did at Bournemouth when he's fit, which he is at the moment. All right, let's get into some of your questions. And I've seen a few like this first one. Should we play all of our Man City and Arsenal players even though the game is hard to call? And realistically, you shouldn't be making decisions about City and Arsenal players any differently to how you would for any other player in your squad. So you look at your Man City player. Is there someone on the bench that's better to play instead? If no, play the Man City player. Or look at whether a transfer is worth it. If not, play the Man City player. And that's it. Just because they're playing against each other doesn't mean that the decision should be any different. Obviously, if you've got a gut feeling in terms of how the game is going to go, that might impact your decision. Like if you think it's going to be open and tons of goals, then you're probably going to want to play your attackers more than defenders. Vice versa, if you think it's going to be tight, maybe it's worth benching attackers more than it usually would be because obviously they're both great sides. But that's all there is to it. You're just looking at the other players in your squad and deciding from there. So for my team, and I'll talk about it in a little bit more detail later. I've got Saka and Haaland, the only two players from this fixture. And on my bench, I've got João Pedro, flagged, Robinson, defender, and Barco, who's not available. Are any of those players worth putting in for Saka or Haaland? No. Now, they might be worth transferring out, and I'll talk about the Saka transfer later. But in terms of playing them, that's a pretty easy decision. Let's say, as an example, instead of João Pedro on the bench, I had... Ollie Watkins, randomly I decided to bench him this week. Would I play Watkins over Saka? Of course I would, right? I know that's a bit of an extreme example, but that's the kind of thing that I'd be looking at. Let's also take another example. Instead of Robinson on the bench, I've got Gabriel, City away. Would I would I play him ahead of Konza, Wolves at home, Porro, Brentford at home, or Trent Bournemouth at home? Probably not. Can Arsenal go to City and get a clean sheet? Absolutely. Could Gabriel score again like against Spurs? Of course he could. But on paper, that's a terrible fixture. And so I would just treat it like any other. If Konza was away to Liverpool and Gabriel was away to City, I'd probably play Gabriel. But with a good home game, I'd probably go for the Villa defender, even though obviously Arsenal overall are the stronger team. So should you play them all? Possibly. Depends who else you've got. So assuming that Watkins has been declared fit by Emery, is he a viable target this week over Salah? For people with Meniz and Izak, the moves could be Izak to Watkins and Meniz to someone cheap, keeping Saka and swerving Salah, and then presumably keeping your wild card and not having to use it in game week six because you'll already have Saka. Now, I haven't seen the Aston Villa press conference at the time recording this because it's quite late today. And to get this video out on time, I can't wait around to see what Unai Emery has said. But I think Watkins has been training, so presumably he's going to be available and not ruled out. I wouldn't worry about the fact that he had ice on his ankle 
during that game uh, in the Champions League. Is Watkins a viable captain over Salah this week? I guess he is because Wolves at home is a good fixture. We saw him play 83 minutes against Everton. He got two goals as well, had more chances too, and that will happen against Wolves. That is a good fixture on paper. I just worry about those early substitutions. The fact that he's just played over 80 minutes against Everton is definitely promising, and that could happen against Wolves as well. But he has been subbed early more often than not. And also, I guess, if you're trying to save your wild card, is Watkins someone that you want moving forward? Now, to be fair, the fixtures are very good, right? So there's no need to worry about having Aston Villa players. After Wolves, it's Ipswich away, Man United at home, Fulham away, Bournemouth home. Really good fixture run for an attacker in particular. I guess it. I guess it will come down to what that extra money blocks you from doing. So, for example, right, I've looked at Game Week 6 wildcard drafts. They'll almost certainly have Haaland and then probably two cheap forwards, I think is what a lot of people will look at. Maybe Solanke, if he does well, maybe Havertz, but they're all cheaper than what Ollie Watkins is. And the reason that is the case is because people are going to want to spend more money elsewhere. So, Watkins is good. He's going to be great this week as long as he's fit and available, which I think he probably will be. And I think he is quite a good captain choice. So if it makes it easier for you to not get Salah and save your wildcard, I quite like that. That would be my overall answer to this question. I still, I still am undecided whether Watkins is a great option moving forward just because of the price. And I think people are going to want to start getting in Arsenal defenders, maybe Raya, you know, still keeping Haaland. Money will get tight when you're trying to build a draft like that. Trying to fit in Watkins as well is going to be difficult. But in terms of, is Watkins a good pick? Yes, of course he is. So there's lots of wildcard questions this week. Would you wildcard in game week six only to catch price changes? There might be a lot with everyone wildcarding. Otherwise, I'd wildcard in game week eight. Now, for what it's worth, and as far as I know, transfers made on wildcards don't count towards the thresholds that a player needs to meet to go up or down in price. So if I wildcard and I bring Saka in, that transfer doesn't count towards him going up in price. It's only the ones made by non-wildcarders. Now, of course, if people are wildcarding, it's because of fixture swings and stuff like that. And non-wildcarders will also be looking at those players. So there will be price changes in game week six to like key Arsenal players, Brentford players and stuff like that. But not necessarily just because everyone is wildcarding. In terms of should you wildcard early, that probably depends on how close the two teams are. So if you've looked at a wildcard eight draft and then you look at wildcard six and they're very similar and you think you're going to be priced out if you don't go early and it improves your team in the short term, then yes, maybe it's worth going early. But if, you, if you're looking at the two different drafts and there's like four, five, six players that are different and your team looks good for game weeks five and six and you don't need the wildcard, I just wouldn't do it. Like it's not like... It's nice to have good team value, and you've seen already this season I've made transfers to protect uh, to protect team value by selling players like Kwanzaa and Nkunku in particular, but it's not the be-all and end-all. Like, different players will emerge. By the time you get to game week eight, the landscape of FPL could be completely different to what it is now. Not necessarily every player will be different, but you look at, I don't know, Vissa getting injured, all of a sudden Sharda might be an option for game week six wildcard as McNeil suddenly looks good. These are cheap players. There'll be more by the time we get to game week eight. So if your team looks good now and it's going to be different in, in eight compared to what it would be in six, I would just wait and not worry about the price changes. So here's a slightly different question about Salah that a lot of people are thinking about for game week five. Is it worth using two free transfers to get Salah in this week as opposed to rolling without him and still wildcarding next week? Rolling and having three free transfers after wildcard is pretty tempting. And I completely understand that, right? That's a really strong position to be in when you wildcard your whole team and then you've still got transfers afterwards to fix any issues that crop up. Really good position to be in. Ultimately, transfers are there to get you points one way or another. Either you've got someone in your team already but there's, who's, who's definitely going to start, but there's someone else you could bring in instead who's going to get you a bunch more points or you're just looking to fix an injury or a suspension or something like that. And that's what you need to weigh up. And unfortunately, I'm not sure I can give you a yes or a no answer because it will depend on what your team looks like right now. And if you don't get Salah, who's your captain going to be? And also what those three transfers would enable you on wildcard six. So to give you an example, I've been talking to Praz quite a lot about different wildcard drafts for game week six. If I wildcard next week, I'm going to get Salah and I'll only have one free transfer. 
he's in a position where he's already got Salah. And so he'll have multiple transfers after he wildcards. So he's looking at getting players like Palmer and going super cheap elsewhere, knowing that if it goes wrong or when he wants to change things around, he's got the transfers to do it. I wouldn't be in such a strong position. So I'd probably go a little bit safer with the players in my draft so that I'm not going to get stuck with them long term because I may not have the transfers to fix it. So for my team, where I guess I'm in a similar position, right? I've got two free transfers right now. I could wildcard next week and have three. I personally think it's more valuable to get Salah in and captain him and fix the issue with Isaac than it would be having extra transfers on wildcard. All it would mean is that on wildcard, I'll play it even safer with my picks and I won't go for like a punt that I wouldn't otherwise think about. So I think the three, four, five transfers being able to be banked this season is really interesting because people are going to have to think about their own teams more than they would have done in previous seasons. Like last year, it'd be really easy to give a generic answer. Absolutely, use your transfers to get Salah. You're going to lose them after wildcard. That's not the case anymore, right? So I would say build a wildcard six draft thinking that you've got three free transfers. Build a wildcard six draft thinking you've got one and see if there's any major differences you would make. If not, I would just use them to get Salah now. And that's probably what I would do if I was wildcarding in, in six. So yeah, what's going to get in the most points? That's basically what we have to figure out. And I know that's why you're asking me. I would probably get Salah in most cases because I would want to captain him. But if you've got a good next option, like a Watkins, Solanke, Son, Palmer, someone like that instead that you could captain, maybe you don't need Salah. So is Arsenal defence a banker from game week six? Could managers be punished by moving away from Liverpool or Man City defence for the likes of Gabriel, Saliba, Raya? Now, I think most people will be in agreement that Arsenal defence is the best in the league and they've got a great chance of having the most clean sheets this season. Teams like Man City and Liverpool will have a say as well, but I think right now Arsenal are a level above. And when you look at the fixtures in, you know, six and seven in particular, it's like it's two home games against Leicester and Southampton. You know, could those two teams score against Arsenal? Of course they could, but the chances are very low and the chances of Arsenal getting clean sheets in those games is very high. And then they got Bournemouth away, which isn't that bad either. Like, fixtures still matter. So between game weeks 9 and 10, Arsenal have got Liverpool at home, Newcastle away, and Chelsea away. They are capable of getting clean sheets in all of those games, but it will be more difficult. So it's not a case of you just stick Arsenal in and they get clean sheets every week. But in terms of having squad players that you just never have to worry about and you can pretty much play them in every single game, like, Arsenal are great. And they are probably, for that reason, better than... I would say they're better than all Man City defenders just because in my opinion it's just not worth the headache of will they won't they start although Rico Lewis has started every game for Man City this season and for Liverpool like Trent is super attacking and he is someone that you could maybe have instead of an Arsenal defender but probably not for six seven and eight like if it was a toss-up between Gabriel or Trent for those three game weeks in particular I'd probably rather have the Arsenal player. Long term, I'd maybe back uh, Trent's attacking capabilities. But Arsenal defence is just legit. And I think a lot of people on game week six, everyone will have at least one Arsenal defender. I think a lot will go two based on what's happened so far and just leave them in and not worry about it. Because there are other defenders and goalkeepers that will get clean sheets along the way, but not as many as Arsenal. And once they're in, you just focus your transfers elsewhere. So one Arsenal defender definite in everyone's team who wildcards next week i think most people will go to will you get punished i mean man city have got pretty good fixtures in seven eight and nine fulham at home walls away southampton home but you're going to get massively punished by having gabriel instead of vario i doubt it um and for liverpool you know after bournemouth at home it's two away games walls and palace and it's chelsea at home arsenal away so it's going to be difficult and they play man city in game week 13 so probably not going to get massively punished either. So has Wildcard 6 lost its appeal a little bit with Arsenal's attack seemingly not great with the Odegaard injury and Brentford losing Visser to injury as well? I would say not really. I think the same about Wildcard 6 as I did a couple of weeks ago. I think it looks pretty good because of the fixture swings. I mean, on Arsenal, I know you've mentioned the attack, but the defence still looks great. So no one's worried about getting one or two defenders in like I just spoke about. And in terms of the attack, I think it's really 
too early to say that Arsenal were just going to be bad without Odegaard. Like, he's missed one game. It was against Spurs away. Now, to be honest, I did expect a few more goals in that game than we got, but it was quite cagey. They've played a Champions League game and not created a huge amount of chances, but that is a Champions League game. And then it's Man City away in five. We're not really going to have the info, I would say, with Spurs away, Champions League, City away, to say the Arsenal attack isn't great and not worth wildcarding for, because essentially... They play Leicester at home, Southampton at home, Bournemouth away. So I am more than happy to take a chance on an Arsenal attacker with those fixtures. I think it's pretty simple. Even to the point where, let's say I wild card in six, I definitely have Saka. 100% absolutely locked in that wild card team. After game week eight, maybe I just sell to someone else ahead of Liverpool, Newcastle, Chelsea. Maybe I go and get Son or Palmer, whoever it might be, and then look to bring in Arsenal later. I think for me, for Arsenal... We just don't have enough info to say the attack is going to be bad without Odegaard. And you're not going to get that info before six. And the fixtures are too good to ignore. And on Brentford, yes, a little bit weaker without Visser. They don't have Thiago. They've sold Tony, as we've spoken about before. But Brian Inbermo is a 7.1 million midfielder on penalties. Very good record as well. He's going to play every single game for 90 minutes most games as well. And has ridiculous fixtures. So there's clean sheet points in there for sure. There's an extra goal because he's a midfielder. Uh, sorry, an extra point for a goal because he's a midfielder. He's on panel as well. Like the, the fixture run for Brent, just look at it. Game week six to whenever, game week 17 or something. It's just insane. There's hardly any bad fixtures in there. You just leave him in and that's it. Like Visa being injured is not great. Maybe it makes overall Brentford's team not so good. But, but for me, and Burma is still a ridiculously good option. And it just wouldn't put me off. And Saka, Arsenal defence, and Inverma are such a key part of wildcard six. I would still want all those players. So no, the appeal hasn't really lessened for me. So I'm just going to quickly run through my team. I'm pretty much in the same position as I was yesterday. So I've got Henderson against Man United at home. Konza, Pedro, Parra, and Trent Alexander-Arnold back three, which I think looks pretty good this week. They've all got decent enough home games. Midfield five, Eze, Fernandez, Saka, Rogers, and Smith Rowe. And then up front, it's Haaland, who's currently my captain, and Izak, who's currently yellow flagged. And if Izak doesn't play at all, I've got Jao Pedro first bench, but he's yellow flagged as well. And then if he doesn't play at all, I've got Robinson from Fulham up against Newcastle United, and I don't really expect a clean sheet there. Now, I don't think my team is the end of the world this week. And if I didn't have any transfers to spend, I'd probably just risk it and start Izak. But because I've got two free transfers... There doesn't feel like a need to take that risk. I might as well use them to try and ensure that I get players that are going to start. The problem is, I still don't know if I'm going to wildcard. So I'm pretty sure I'm selling Izak this week. But I'm not sure where I'm going to use the money. It's either to do something like Izak to Calvert-Lewin and then Saka to Salah, captain him and then wildcard next week to get Saka back, and then Arsenal defenders in Burmo, etc. Or it's Izak to Calvert-Lewin, who's also yellow flag, by the way, but it's just illness. I think he's going to start against Leicester. I've not really got any worries about that. Keep Saka, and then do Smith-Rowe to in Burmo instead. So I think he's better than Smith-Rowe this week, and he's definitely better from game week six onwards, and just save my wildcard. That would leave me two million in the bank, which is enough money to go from Robinson... Or, or Barco, to be fair, up to Gabriel, right? So that would get me my second Arsenal player. I think if the deadline was in five minutes, I would just do the Saka to Salah move, captain him, be happy with my captain choice in five, and then just wild card in six. But I know deep down, this squad doesn't need a wild card in six. Like, Salah is such a big reason that I'm thinking about activating my wild card next week. If Salah had a slightly harder fixture, or Harden had a slightly easier one, I would not even be considering a wildcard six. That's how fine the margin is for whether I use it. And this is just going to be a ramble, by the way. So switch off now. There's not going to be anything more after I talk about my team in this video. Um, and I think a lot of people would probably just get Salah. And I think that's the... It's the safe route in terms of how I feel about my team. I'll be much happier with it this week. And I'm happy enough to wildcard next week. But, but I honestly think this team is, is absolutely fine from game week six onwards. Like, if that was my squad, and I, do, and I use my one free transfer next week to do Robinson to Gabriel, I genuinely think that looks fine. Of course, wildcard six teams will be better, as they should be. 
but then the chip's also gone. Whereas the hope would be that I could keep up with wildcard as we get close to keeping up and then make use of it later on. And the, the problem is I don't I don't know what other window I will use it in. I probably won't go in wildcard eight, maybe twelve, possibly even later than that. And that's not a huge problem because stuff will happen. Like there will be issues later on this season. It always is the case. And so the wild card is always handy to have. It's just can I put myself through not having Salah this week? Because I think he is by far the best captain. I know people are looking at like Watkins and players like that, and that's fine. But for me, Salah is the best. And I always like to have the best captain every week, if I can. It just looks like such a good time to do it. i got to be honest, right? If I'm thinking back to preseason, I probably should have given game week five more thought. Because I think I was saying that like, I'll just wildcard if I need to, which is fine. But I should have probably planned it a bit better than this. I mean, in hindsight, it's easy to say I should have just started with Salah, but I was never going to do that, so I'm not worried about that. But I should have thought about what the move was in five. Maybe I should have just started with Gabriel, for example, but then that would block me from getting Salah anyway. You know, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure what is going to make is going to push me one way or another. It'll probably just be the captaincy. This week. But I just I do love this team for next week. I think it's fine. Okay, I don't have the third Arsenal, and I've still got Henderson in goal. But apart from that, the rest of the squad, it's not perfect, but it, there's nothing wrong with it. Like People might not have Fernandez or Eze on wildcard, but they're not terrible options moving forward. I'm, I'm going to get Salah. I, I know deep down that's what I'm going to do, but I also know deep down this squad is really good for game week six. That's my team. So I'm probably going to... So Okay, so just to run this back, I'm probably just going to do Saka to Salah, captain him, no brainer once you've got him, right? You don't even have to think about caps if you own Salah. And then I've got 6.7 million to spend on a forward for Isaac um, in game week five. I'm probably going to go for Calvert Lewin. I don't know. Jamie Vardy is tempting. I, 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 probably Jamie Vardy, actually. If by the time this video goes out, we've seen the Aston Villa press conference and Unai Emery has ruled Watkins out, then I'll definitely get Duran. But I think Watkins will be fine. I'm not worried about that. So it's going to be Vardy or Calvert-Lewin. Um, interestingly, by the way, side note, if Jean Pedro does miss out, Danny Welbeck's almost certainly going to start, and he probably will be on penalties. So you could argue that Welbeck is actually better than both Vardy and Calvert-Lewin for game week five only. And remember, this would only be a one-week punt for me. I don't think there's any other forwards that I'm interested in. Like the lap versus Southampton, maybe. Um, I can't go for Mateta. And Ketia against Man United, probably not. Nicholas Jackson, I can't afford. Raul Jimenez against Newcastle, probably not. So it really is kind of Welbeck, Vardy, or Calvert-Lewin, and then get Salah, and then just probably wildcard, and then be annoyed that when I wild... Like, <laughs> yeah. Again, coming back to this squad really quickly. Sorry, I'm just going to boy to death with this. If I put Calvert-Lewin in now, and in Burmo back in uh, and then gabriel as well like this is the squad that i can have in six i reckon right now calvert lewin harlan maybe jao pedro possibly rogers in burmo saka i think i might keep fernandez i hate to say it gabriel porro like eight of that squad will be in my wildcard six and most of them are starters every week i'm gonna leave it there i'm probably getting salah captain in him and probably vardy that's probably going to be the move. If you enjoyed it, give it a like. Hit that subscribe button. Join me for the deadline stream tomorrow starting at 9 a.m. UK time. And don't forget to download Sleeper if you haven't already. Links in the description below. I'll catch you again tomorrow.